Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Wilson Stribling. Welcome to another edition of At Issue, where we discuss and debate the critical issues facing the state of Mississippi and how these issues impact you. And we want you to share your opinions and comments with us. Just go to Facebook.com slash MPB Online News. On Twitter, our handle is at MPB News. Also, visit our webpage, mpbonline.org slash issue. At issue tonight, the Cleveland School desegregation case. It's a decades old case and it brings back memories for many of anger and fear, frustration and inequality, racism. The separation of black and white in everyday life was once acceptable long ago, especially here in the South. It infested every aspect of life in neighborhoods, in the workplace and in schools. 50 years ago, a group of parents of more than 100 black students sued what was at that time the Bolivar County School District. They wanted the schools there to desegregate. The case has been through several federal judges. There were rulings to create attendance zones and magnet programs. The school district submitted plans over time working toward racial integration. The latest ruling all these years later by U.S. District Judge Deborah Brown calls for desegregation of the school system by consolidating the city of Cleveland's two high schools and consolidating the two middle schools. The Cleveland School District is currently appealing, saying they want to preserve the rights for parents to choose the public school to which they wish to send their children, whether white or black. Here's what the judge's order says. The Cleveland School District must consolidate the all-black East Side High School with the half-black, half-white Cleveland High School. Those students would attend the Cleveland High School campus. Mostly black D.L. Smith Middle School would consolidate with the half-black, half-white Margaret Green Junior High. Those students would be placed at the East High School campus. We traveled to Cleveland to see if people there are in favor or are against the desegregation plan. MPB's Mark Rigsby reports. It's a Friday night in Mississippi. Rival high schools, Cleveland and Eastside. The battle for 61 is for bragging rights on the gridiron. It's a tradition that goes back many decades. Tony Cleveland played in this game between the two schools in 1984. One school didn't like each other it was back, in, back during the day. One school didn't like each other. But see, but see we, all went, we all grew up together, see. But it was, it, it, when you get on the field, it was just, just like, it, we got to win, you got to win. He says he lived on the east side of town, but his mother wanted him to go to Cleveland High. Back in school, back then, there was a lot of violence over there during the time. And she decided she didn't want me to go to school over there, so I respected her for that. Cleveland says he supports a federal judge's order to desegregate the school system by consolidating these two high schools and the two middle schools in the city. But Cleveland, it got a tradition of being tight with folks, you know what I'm saying? The only thing we got to do is get together man, and, and, and unity. That's all it's supposed to be all about, unity, not, not, not against each other. It's not what it appears on the outside. So it's not the the hate-hate situation that some of the people have been making issue with. William Quinton graduated from Cleveland High and both of his sons went there. It wasn't much of a decision at that particular time. Uh, we lived on the side of the tracks that went to Cleveland High School. If you lived on the other side of the tracks, you went to the east side at that particular time. Quinton says he has mixed feelings on the subject. Cleveland High School is almost 50-50 as it is. Eastside High School is majority black. Uh, the kids get along. There's tradition with Eastside. There's tradition with Cleveland High School. And I will say this, when my oldest boy was going to Cleveland High School, they would bus to Eastside for certain classes. He became very, very close to some of those players that he played summer sports with. And so things have changed. Now, I don't think the desegregation plan is going to function in the manner in which they think it is. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Uh, is it bad? I, I can't say that. Let's see what happens. Cleveland High was known as the white school because of its attendance and location on the west side of town as it relates to the city's demographics. Today, the racial makeup of Cleveland High is half white, half black. Across town, Eastside has been known as the black school for the same reasons. 
but its racial makeup is unchanged. I enjoyed the job, but the conditions weren't favorable for what I was attempting to do. James Stamps moved to Cleveland in 1958. He was the band director at Eastside High for 36 years. When I started work, I worked in the dressing room under the bleachers in the gym for many years. Then I was moved to the stage in the gym for band classes. During that period of time, a band room was built, I've forgotten the year, but at Cleveland High. A band room which uh, the facility contained uh, office space, uniform storage space, dressing rooms, practice rooms, and what have you. Normally, a band room would have, and restrooms, air-conditioned. At the same time, <laughs> a year later, four walls were put up at east side for a bath band room. Just four walls now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no restrooms, no office space, no practice room, and that still exists. But through the course of the years of working, I did get uh, air conditioning and uh, restrooms installed. But for many years, I worked without that. Stamp says he knows firsthand about the difference in resources for the black schools and the white schools. When it came to getting equipment, uh, at that time, there was an army surplus in Jackson. <laughs> uh, when I would ask for equipment, the superintendent would make a trip down and come back with a load of junk, <laughs> you know, from the uh, surplus. And at the same time, they were getting new equipment and supplies at the other school. Stamp says he supports the plan to have all students, black and white, attend one school for high school and one middle school where everyone has an equal opportunity to benefit from the resources provided by the school district. My thing is that one school would probably in, improve the whole, you know, makeup of the community. I think that is in the best interest of the children in the Cleveland School District. I agree with Brown versus the Board of Education. Separate will never be equal. And I feel that the Justice Department's plan is the best way to achieve uh, integration in the school district, considering the size of the community, the size of the school, and most importantly, the needs of the students. Sherry Shepard says she supports the desegregation of the school district. Um, the district had not feel, fulfilled their role in providing equitable resources to all of the schools in Cleveland. We had a uh, buildings that were not maintained as they should have been. Um, the needs of some students um, in the district were being neglected and that uh, was determined by the side of the track that they lived on. Shepard's daughter was the co-valedictorian for Cleveland High and the first black student to earn that distinction. The other co-valedictorian was white. She questions the process for choosing the students for the school's highest award as it relates to the desegregation controversy. Cleveland High School has never had co-valedictorians. So to have one at this time, when it's the first opportunity for a black to have achieved that honor, gave pause to me. And the way they handled the situation also caused pause. Back at the game, there's a show of unity between Cleveland and Eastside with both schools' marching bands performing together at halftime. The students, parents, and supporters on both sides know implementing the desegregation plan means this decades-long tradition, Cleveland versus Eastside, would fade away. Eventually, new traditions would be made. Well, I love the city of Cleveland, and whatever happens, uh, we will prevail. I mean, we'll, we'll be all right. Mark Rigsby, MPB News. We are joined now by Matt Steffi, a professor at the Mississippi College School of Law in Jackson. Uh, Matt, thank you for being with us on uh, At Issue. How is uh -huh. it that we are talking about desegregating schools here in 2016? It, it is a very curious question. And the reason is this is a case that started in the late 1960s where there was a constitutional violation found that is purposeful segregation uh, by the government. And then it's passed through various uh, 
uh, proposed remedies and various judges, ver the, the attention of the Justice Department intermittently. But essentially, a new judge has taken a fresh look at it and realized that the district never achieved desegregation, that is, never achieved the remedy that was ordered in the beginning. And there was court supervision of desegregation remedies wasn't that uncommon as late as the 1990s, but this is one of the oldest cases in the United States that has never achieved the remedy required by the Constitution originally. And where I believe on the second generation of the plaintiff's family, do the plaintiffs have to call for the judges to act or is this on the judges to eventually uh, find a, a true remedy? Well, I, at, the, at the end of the day, it's on the judges, but, but that's the, 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 the disinterest of plaintiffs in, in pushing forward all the time is one of the things that explains the delay that if nobody's pushing a case, judges will, because it's the, the judges often conceive of it as the party's case, right? The judge is there as the referee, the parties are there as the, uh, uh, the people contesting the issues, and as long as they're working it out and working towards a solution, judges will often take a hands-off approach. Ultimately, though, when a case gets old enough, a judge will say, we've got to clear it off the docket one way or the other. I think one of the dynamics at play here has always been a problem in desegregation uh, cases. We saw it with the so-called heirs litigation with Mississippi's colleges and universities. And that is that the remedy the law most clearly uh, directs you towards, the, the, the law most clearly permits, is consolidation of all the schools. And that's not always what the plaintiffs want. It's almost never what the defendants want. The defendants like the status quo. Uh, the change that the law seems to demand or direct maybe something different than the plaintiffs ultimately want. So if the best remedy in the eyes of the plaintiffs is not the courts, how might a situation like this be resolved without involving the courts? Well, and I think that's what's been happening for the past decades, that with the uh, help here and there of the Justice Department to try to negotiate something uh, with the school district that addresses the constitutional violation in a way that satisfies the courts and the parties and allows the matter uh, to be uh, dismissed and brought to an end. Uh, I think what's unusual about this case is despite the generations of people, uh, the involvement of various parties and multiple judges, that's never been achieved. There have been various efforts to bring about the required desegregation, negotiating between the plaintiffs and the school board and, and the other parties involved, but it's never really worked. Professor Matt Steffi from the Mississippi College School of Law. Stay right there, we'll come back to you in just a moment. The Cleveland School Board voted along racial lines to appeal the judge's order to desegregate. Board members are staying tight-lipped about the case. We attended a board meeting open to the public on Monday, August 8th. All five members of the school board were asked to answer questions on the desegregation case for at issue, and all five members declined to comment. School Board Attorney Jamie Jacks spoke on behalf of the board. Well, the board is appealing the ruling. Uh, the board's official position is and has been that it believes it's doing everything that it was supposed to do under the previous consent orders that the district has been under since 1969, 1970 was the last major order. So the board's position has been that we think we've done really everything we can do. We think we have an integrated school district. We're proud of the level of integration that we have and we would urge uh, anyone who thinks otherwise to look around at the different districts surrounding us and see that there's absolutely no integration going on at those other districts. The appeal will be based on the fact that open enrollment or what Judge Davidson, our previous judge, called true freedom of choice, that that is a constitutional plan in 2016. Uh, that is the sum of our appeal, that if you say to a group of American citizens, uh, you may choose whichever school you want to go to, and here's two high schools and here's two junior highs. That, that is a constitutional concept in 2016. Um, it's, a, it's a question that the United States Supreme Court has not uh, really taken up in a long time. Freedom of choice plans were uh, not accepted back in the late 60s because they weren't doing much in terms of changing things within school districts. But our argument on appeal will be, this is not 1969 anymore, it's 2016. 
and a lot of the impediments that were perhaps there in 1969 uh, or in the 60s or 70s simply aren't there anymore. Um, there was a lot of uh, hate still going on, uh, not just in Mississippi, but in other places, and a lot of uncomfortableness. Um, but we believe, as a district, true freedom of choice can work in our district. Um, not just our district, but any district. The Cleveland School District, like many other districts, had what was called a de jure system, a de jure system, which was, unfortunately and tragically, by law, we had a dual school system. And it wasn't just Cleveland, it was every uh, school district across the South and some in the North. Um, so yes, there were absolute problems back in the 60s that uh, rightfully the court system fixed. Um, Many districts are still working through you know, some of those issues, and obviously we're here today because the Department of Justice thinks we didn't go far enough. Um, but we think that in Cleveland, we have a success. We have a success story here. And I'm proud to represent our district in this case, um, and the board is, is happy to appeal it uh, because it believes that we haven't done wrong, but we've done something very right here. I think that, unfortunately, the headline has been Cleveland School District ordered to desegregate when the board's position would be, we are desegregated. What about our district is segregated when you have a system of choice? Just in the last year, we looked at statistics from the uh, 2015 beginning to end, and we lost 85 white students, which is a 7.5% drop. And that's significant, that's not normal. Um, normally you see like a one to two percent gain or loss every year just happens. So yes, I mean that is what's, what's frightening. We, we hope this year we'll see the numbers. We've had enrollment, there hasn't been anything um, major reported to me in terms of enrollment, so I hope that our families are now, we've had a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction, but maybe our families are sticking with us. And, um, there's been a lot of, uh, I think, some on social media, different schools are kind of giving themselves shout, shout outs, you know, and, and showcasing their teachers and their accomplishments. And we've got to do that because um, otherwise everyone else creates the narrative about Cleveland and we don't. And there are so many good things going on in our public school system. So while we've seen a little bit of, 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 of flight from white families, um, we would hope it's contained, but that is the, that is the that is the fear. When comparing the racial makeup of the Cleveland School District to other school districts in the Delta, the issue of white flight is possible if not inevitable. There are approximately 3,700 students in the Cleveland School District. 65% are black, 30% are white. Clarksdale, Greenwood, and Greenville, where desegregation has taken place, all have majority black public school district populations of 92% or more. We bring Matt Steffi back into the conversation, now law professor at the Mississippi College School of Law. With the school board there in Cleveland uh, appealing this decision, wanting to stick with freedom of choice, how strong is that argument uh, and how likely are they to win or lose their appeal? It's very difficult to predict because of a opposition of two aspects of the case. If you just looked at it, and all you looked at was the law and the legal rules that emerged from the desegregation cases. The argument is there was a constitutional violation, no doubt about that, a duty to remedy it and root out segregation, root and branch, and that hasn't happened. And that makes the judge's decision strong on the law. On the other hand, it's been decades. Uh, there, there have been some efforts to be made. The remedy is resisted by uh, uh, all parties, it appears, and, or many parties. And the Fifth Circuit is, a, is perhaps the most conservative uh, appellate federal court in the country. Um, they tend to, to, to vote often for the government and allow the government room to try to do its business. And so it would not be a surprise if a panel of the Fifth Circuit said, the school district has done enough and focus more on the facts and the efforts and the passage of time and individual choice than the law. It also wouldn't be a surprise if it, if it went from the Fifth Circuit to the Supreme Court and like the 
Ayers litigation about colleges and universities, the Supreme Court said, no, it's the legal principles that matter. So I think there are, in terms of just strictly legal principles, the, the judge's ruling is on, uh, on sound ground. But I, I think they've got a substantial chance of convincing an appellate court that no remedy at this point is going to make the situation any better than the one they've got right now. How much longer do you think that process will keep this tied up in the court system? If the school district wins, the case could be over next year. If the judge's ruling is put into effect, I would think at least five more years of court supervision until there's a chance for this new system uh, to kind of shake out. With enrollment, wide enrollment, already down in the school district, district uh, since this all happened, uh, do you think we could see an, another case of white flight here all these years after desegregation sadly, officially I, took it? Sadly, I think so. I, I think white flight is not confined to the South. It's, it, it, it's an almost inevitable response. Right now, we have the traditionally uh, white schools that are mixed race about 50-50. Uh, if it's consolidated, then the white students become a substantial minority. There may be parents who decide they don't want for that for their kids and either move or move their children to private schools. Moving out of the district or moving children to private schools is not within the reach of the court's remedy. And if I were arguing for the school board, this is one of the facts that I would highlight in my argument, saying it's no remedy at all if consolidation triggers white flight and what we end up with five years from now is a Cleveland school district that's, again, one race uh, because uh, the, the overwhelming majority of white parents have taken their children out. The counter argument to that is that you can't facilitate private acts of discrimination, that those private decisions to opt out because they don't want to mix uh, and be a minority race in the school district aren't something that the, that, that the government can legitimately take into account. There are, there are good arguments on both sides. Uh, I, and the Fifth Circuit is as friendly a forum and has shown friendliness to the district in the past in approving aspects of the choice plan. That uh, I, I think it's just too soon to tell how the appeal will go. Uh, but sadly, the, you, you know, I would predict an increase in white flight. If after all, if, and if the imposition of a court ruling that says consolidation is coming, triggers white flight even before it happens, uh, one would expect that to accelerate if a court uh, puts a permanent stamp of approval on that plan. Well, then you have what you talked about earlier, where you have a, a government action creating a segregated school district, do you not? Well, you do and you don't. You do in a normal conversational sense, but legally what you have is the government saying, everybody's going to go to the same schools. And there, there's precedent going back that says when people opt out, that's not a choice that's attributed to the government action. And if that were to happen and you ended up with a 100 percent minor, 100 percent African-American school district, is there anything the courts could do? Is there any legal action a citizen could take to get the courts to do something to change that? There's really nothing that can be done because the, the district can't reach outside of district lines and require children to attend. Uh, Parents have a constitutional right to, to move and to send their children to a, uh, a private school. And the Supreme Court long ago said that remedies have to respect district lines. So the short answer is no. And, 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 and if the answer ends up being uh, a one-race school, to paraphrase uh, uh, Bob Dole from years ago, it must be a darn peculiar question. If the answer is ultimately they're going to operate a unitary one-race school system, that's a peculiar answer to the problem of segregation to begin with. And that's why courts have struggled with it. That's why this court has struggled with it so long. I was going to say, is that why we've been taught, why we're still talking about because this all these years Because the legal later? remedy produces a result that literally no one wants. That consolidation is the clearest legal remedy that may involve the loss of neighborhood schools, which the plaintiffs don't want, and white flight, which nobody wants. Well, we can't go back to the time when this suit was first filed right. and change the circumstances that happened then. We have to deal with the circumstances that are here today. Can yeah. you think of a better remedy than what has been proposed? I, I can't think of a... I think the court basically has two choices. This remedy 
or let the parties kind of keep working on it indefinitely. But federal courts aren't supposed to be kind of the, the permanent backdrop to school board negotiations. But if there's an easy alternative answer, it's not obvious what it is. And there have been interested, intelligent, hardworking parties looking for 40 odd years to find one. Uh, and, and again, that's the same problem we encountered with the colleges and universities. The obvious answer, legally speaking, in some instances was to consolidate universities. Consolidating universities is like consolidating schools. It upsets somebody every time. Uh, and you know, government action is only unlawful if its purpose is to uh, uh, to treat people differently on the basis of race. And so white flight is attributable to the government only if the government is taking its action because it's going to trigger white flight, not in spite of it. And this is pretty clearly an instance where the white flight would be an unintended, undesired consequence. Uh, you know, I don't envy the Fifth Circuit sorting this out. Uh, you know, if you simply ask yourself what's best, looking at this anew, I'm not sure what the answer is, and I'm not sure the law helps us answer that question. A good point to end on. Matt Steffi with the Mississippi College School of Law, thank you very much. My pleasure. For more information on the Cleveland School desegregation case, go to our website, mpbonline.org issue. You can find the full-length interviews we conducted with guests on this program, as well as additional information and links. But for now, we are out of time. Join us next week for another edition of At Issue.